Carol remembered I had given yes. discounts to, to trouble there. I know I can rush there, but you know what? This is better. But yeah. Um, so did you publish, did you submit to the place where you've been working with? Or you I, uh, no, you did not because it, as we, you had, you no, 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 well, everything I did. Once they give me a full reject, I'm going to get that full reject out of the way and then I'll do it. For anyone who wants to. That, I mean, that, would be awesome. that would be awesome. Yeah, I, I, I have so many more. It's kind of, yeah. Um, we're the science like that doesn't really right. philosophers, but the makeup of the research group. And I always find that we always come back to like, we got to publish, we got to get data. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, it's one oh, wait, but that's <coughs> my, that's 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 my, it's really hard it, to like, get out there and say, okay, how else can we get this reset? Right. So, like, yeah. it's just, I think the board of that model is really good. Yeah. 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 There's so much that I don't understand, but also like videos that you will not press it as well. Yeah. 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 Right. It's still very And you derive energy from it. I mean, yeah. there's like the like pushing it. I hope it's a nice because it's actually made by like contributors. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Which is totally like, fine. Like, like, I don't care. I can talk about this. And you did. Until I, you know, get blue in the face. But um, and how I had her things kind of like. Okay, welcome. Welcome in person people, welcome Zoom people. Uh, I'm hoping that, <laughs> can somebody um, indicate if Zoom world, if you can hear us? Can you hear? Fantastic. So welcome. Uh, I know we're in the anchor position on presenting today. So thank you for sticking around for this uh, last presentation of the day. We'll be talking about human skills today uh, beyond the robots, since we're all in a new world with lots of AI and, and robots. Uh, so thinking about what it means to be human and what we can offer our students. Um, and just to uh, do introductions. So do you want to start with introductions? Sure, can everyone hear me? My name is Arielle Bernstein. I'm in the literature department. Um, I also co-direct the Masters in uh, Literature, Culture, and Technology. Um, the main things that I study are I research the myriad ways that new forms of uh, technology shape human expression, communication, intimacy, and empathy. And my writing has been in a bunch of those different publications up there. And I'm Erica Hart. I'm in psychology. I also uh, work on intimacy and, and empathy, too, but in a different world. Um, I teach undergrads and grad students. My grad students, I'm teaching how to do therapy. Uh, my undergrads, I teach a, a range of courses at this point. I'm a term faculty, so very versatile, of course. Um, I also uh, am the director of our uh, psychotherapy training clinic. I'm the associate director of clinical training and the director of externships. So a lot of service in my job too. Okay, uh, so for this uh, course, uh, we have to talk about learning objectives. So hopefully after you, you leave, some, some homework for y'all, uh, we're gonna talk about some of the challenges that technology throws our way. Um, we're gonna think about human skills and how to build those, how to cultivate that uh, for our students. And then here's, here's your homework, uh, because we're all polishing up, finalizing our, our syllabi. Um, thinking about how you wanna approach your assignments to help build these human skills um, in light of, of where we are with uh, generative AI and uh, what kind of world that our students are uh, walking into, graduating from. Um, and, and again, more, more homework for y'all, refining your activities and assignments uh, to better support these human skills. 
with that in mind, we're really excited to have this um, presentation be as collaborative and as much of a conversation as possible. I know Erica and I were really excited to meet and see how, even with different disciplines, there was so much overlap in terms of our research and the work that we're doing. Um, so I know I always start the semester kind of with a look at the film Her. I'm not sure if other folks have seen this film. Um, but we have protagonist Theodore Twombly, uh, who ends up falling in love with uh, his OS, his operating system in this film. Um, and he also works for a company that is basically outsourcing. People hire him to write love letters for other people. And this is one of the texts that we always discuss in my classes because my students feel so strongly that you should not outsource your love letters to other people or to other forms of technology. We talk a little bit about ChatGPT and how that would be a terrible idea and use that as a jumping point to talk about a little bit about ethically how we feel um, about using technology in the classroom. What are some of the potential pieces that are exciting and what are some of the things that are potentially a little bit more problematic? Um, so the allure of AI, technology can offer a tremendous range of options for us, but there are also downsides and um, we need to consider this new future and how it's going to affect us. And I really love to think about this in terms of how are we engaging our students in the classroom? Many of them are already thinking about these things already. So that takes us to the other side, right? The human skills. What makes us, uh, I don't know, valuable in this world, uh, which is something we're all grappling with, right? With this, this new technology. Um, where does that leave us? What's precious about, about being a, a human? Um, and I uh, put this uh, poem up. There's something about it that feels like it's speaking to our world right now with that idea of a, uh, not a code to be broken. Um, you know, what is, what is what we're giving them? It's, it's not a, a code to be broken, right? There's something human about what we're offering in our courses. Um, so I, I guess I want to ask you all, um, what are human skills? What do you think you're offering to students uh, that they can't get through uh, plugging in a, a prompt with uh, ChatGPT? We can do a pair share, because that's always good, right? Uh, so I'd like you to turn to your neighbor, find, find a new friend, um, and start to brainstorm what human skills you offer to your students, uh, you love in your students, you recognize in your students, and we'll come back in a moment and talk about those human skills. So I'll give you, uh, let's say two or three minutes to thinking on your feet uh, to come up with a few human skills. So uh, I'm Brian. Oh, okay. Feels like there could be a solution. 
uh, but it's never going to fall back on saying, I don't know, which is a, is a useful thing, I think, that we are able to do, and acknowledge when we are missing information and go, go uh, find it in your Okay, class. Let's get back together. Um, what we can do is we'll start with some of the answers that folks uh, in the virtual world gave us. Um, so what constitutes uh, human skills? Uh, we've got, let's see, we'll start with this. Um, presence and empathy. Uh, ability to make connection between works. Um, and student unique, students' unique observations about the material. Um, where did it go? Trying uh, to grow students who uh, do not need the internet or AI tools in order to think. Um, ability to recognize and use different kinds of sources. Care and empathy for me, which I love, uh, and each other, yes. Um, caring for the success of one another. Passion for learning. Listening to each other. Uh, learning how to identify assumptions behind arguments. I call that critical thinking, too. Um, how to think like a social scientist, love that. Um, how to develop an argument with evidence. Um, uh, ability to craft a coherent argument and support it with evidence from a variety of sources. So a lot of good ideas. How about uh, people in the, you know, uh, in, in the classroom world? Um, anyone? You can take the mic. So not an AI, uh, from, from a person, I can offer my personal experiences, my different background, you know, all my lived experiences and failures and the lessons that I learned hard way. Yeah, all those things, the AI can never do that. My different perspectives from different backgrounds, all these things. I love that experience and what I call, what we call human messiness, you know, the, the realness, the mistakes. Yeah, what else? No. So we have four things here, um, and some may overlap. Prioritizing what's important, disciplinary intuition, helping them learn, and then the last, I didn't really know how to put a nice little sheen on it, but if you go from going from a written instructions, which is sort of the lowest level, to a YouTube, I'd rather learn from a YouTube, versus a written instruction, I'd rather learn from an instructor who not only was like a YouTube, but you can customize it so you have two-way interaction. I can ask them questions. Okay, that human interaction, love that. What else? What are the other human skills that we can help uh, our students grow? Yes. Uh, we talked about discussion here, and um, something that I wanted to emphasize within discussion is instead of listening to respond, listen to understand. That's something that you can do with um, electronics or AI. Yes, their their intent is to respond, right? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, any any last minute ones we haven't discussed? Um, so what I was thinking about, what I have been thinking about for the last few years, um, is this idea of transversal skills, human skills. Um, and there's some, some writing out there on this. Um, 
These are skills that are not discipline specific. They're not about content. Uh, they're about the doing as opposed to maybe a, a particular uh, work product or, or fact to memorize. Um, and they're really important in the workplace uh, for their future. Uh, and, I, and I think about this is sort of the value add that college, that, that higher education can bring us. Uh, things like dig digital competencies, information literacy, how to call BS on what you're reading, mm -hmm. requires some, some critical thinking, requires some uh, knowing the sources, problem solving, that struggle, that's always baked into the growth piece is kind of, oh gosh, I don't know how I would answer that. I love modeling this kind of getting stuck where a student will ask me a question and I don't need, know that particular literature very well, but I might ask, well, how would we test that? That's a great question. Uh, let's think about designing a study that might help us to, to find that answer. Uh, initiative, taking initiative, you know, taking that, that next step. Uh, and I, I have some examples of students taking initiative that's just absolutely lovely. Uh, learning to learn, um, that, that passion. Uh, cultural awareness, uh, resiliency, adaptability, kind of part of that problem solving process maybe. Uh, empathy, social intelligence, inter and intrapersonal awareness, kind of knowing yourself, knowing others uh, requires putting yourself in other people's shoes. Uh, empathy, certainly a big part of, uh, you know, teaching my, my graduate students how to do therapy. Uh, creativity, critical thinking, working together. Uh, by a show of hands, and I uh, apologize to the, the folks on Zoom, I, I guess you could show, show hands. Um, how many of you have some human skill that you're really hoping uh, to build in your students? Is there anyone who, who doesn't? I, uh, I'll, I'll flip it. Anyone who doesn't have human skills in their course? Just double checking, just double checking. OK, we all do. We all have human skills. So how are we going to um, really uh, find assignments to leverage these human skills? Um, but before we do that, what are we up against? I was just thinking there'd be like a robot like in the corner over there that is the only one who doesn't, yeah, not teaching human skills. Um, so we're all so passionate about these things that I can tell just from the energy in the room. Um, so we thought we'd actually take a moment to ask, what are some of the headwinds? What are some of the things that are kind of we're up against. We care so deeply about these kinds of human skills. We're in this field, we're in a variety of disciplines that are really caring about these fields. What are some of the things that you feel are challenging right now with these new technologies so that we're maybe not getting to those human skills or it feels a little bit harder? So right now I'm listening to Audible book. <laughs> Uh, Elon Musk by Walter Isaacson, and you, you know he's not. Em I mean, he doesn't have empathy. He really pushes through, and then he's successful. So now I'm listening the detailed stories of how he struggled to build these uh, great companies, and then eventually succeeded. So I'm like, there's a model, and there's this argument that in order to succeed, like massively succeed, you have to be like that, like uh, Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. So that's an, one kind of message that our students are hearing. So I think not only just the technology, but that kind of message that success, 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 a big success, that I think that's uh, a huge headwind that we are facing, our students are facing. Yeah, this obsession with like speed and efficiency and like doing things in a very particular way that often comes up against what we want to be teaching our students. And that's an excellent point. Yeah, should I run over? <laughs> Wait, where? Oh. <laughs> and just to build on what we just heard, yes, um, you know, I've seen a lot of articles talking about how 
there's um, this sense of I don't need a college degree to make a lot of money. And and then if if I go to college because my parents really want to, then I'll just do this, you know, just do everything very quickly, get a degree and then actually get a job and make all the money I can. So and, and of course, there's this pressure um, on social media as well, that this is how things are going uh, to to and and you know, anybody can succeed and become an Elon Musk. So the, the purpose of a college education is exclusively financial as opposed to being about these other kinds of skills as well. So the problem is attention span. I know most, my, I always fighting, you know, the most important thing is sitting on my phone versus listening what's going on right now. So I'm sure my students are always fighting that too. And that's such a great point that I feel like a lot of times when we talk about the things that are the challenges that our students are facing, they're things that all of us are really facing. Yeah. Anything else? Other things that might be headwinds? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have some in the chat. Someone also mentioned short attention spans. And then Laura said, uh, not sure if this is relevant, but lack of time, lack of time management skills. Students are working multiple jobs and do not have the time or do not think they have the time to write the essay. And it takes less time to use uh, generative AI to write the assignment. Yeah. Elizabeth also said that the value of efficiency uh, based on neoliberalism over the over other values such as empathy, compassion, community, and process. So these are what I'm hearing, these are meaningful, meaningful headwinds that are not there, they're about the world outside of our classroom. They're about the real world that we're really up against quite a bit. Yeah. I was just gonna drop two sound bites. Um, Bridget Trogdon, Dean of Undergrad Education, because this this is what I think about all the time. I was thinking about it this morning while I was walking the dog. Um, but, you know, and, and I think sometimes it's it comes across as though there's not the passion, but there are wheels turning behind that we don't always know about. But my, my two sound bites, I had a former university president who once said, education is the one place where the consumer demands the minimum, right? Which is something to think about. But on the other hand, why do we refer to our students as consumers? They're not. Um, and I, I'm still chewing on this, but I have a collaborator who said something to me in the fall that the students are the product, the world is the consumer. And I'm not saying that's, that I agree with everything about that, but I keep chewing on it and coming back to it. And I think it all ties in with that question. So thank you for asking it. Hi, I'm Hannah Park, I'm the education librarian. Um, I, I went to the keynote, Bridget, that you, the, so there was a keynote yesterday and there was a panel of students um, and kind of you could parse together that students, you know, they had an excellent time here, but there was something missing about community. And then I actually had a chance to talk to one of the students today, but I was standing in line at the lunch um, and he was saying that he, the pandemic, you know, whatever, we all went through the pandemic, but there's something about kids, students now, they don't know how to be in community. And he was saying like, he wants to go into education to look at exactly this, like how can we develop our human skills? How can we like know how to interact with each other? And so I, that, I was just so struck by that, by how our students are so lonely and they don't know how to connect with each other. And that goes to exactly this, this point of how can we build these human skills. I think it's such a great point too about the hunger for those skills that it's something that we want to be teaching our students but also it's something that our students are really craving and they're looking for when they're coming into our classroom. So yeah, we had, um, we had focused on things that I think kind of came up in our conversation, this anxiety about grades, Difficulty tolerating uncertainty, reluctance to take academic risks is something that I think we're seeing more and more. Students want to have a model. They want to have a model they can follow to a T so they can make us happy, so they can get a good grade, so they can become the next Elon Musk, I suppose. Um, transactional attitude, this idea that they're doing something um, not because it's necessarily their passion or even that they're intellectually curious about it, but they just, they just need to do it because. And so these are really, I think, a little bit of what we're up against when we're talking about cultivating human skills in the classroom. Okay, so 
we were thinking about what is the hook? How do we get students on board with thinking about these human skills, uh, with sort of managing the headwinds uh, that, that we're up against? And we thought about how personal projects, uh, making them personal and engaging. Uh, we have a couple of examples of the kinds of assignments, the kinds of um, uh, ways of presenting the topics that can really help to build, to grow those, those human skills. And I'll start out, this is a, an image that came from my son's, um, I was chaperoning a, a field trip for my son's fifth grade class, um, and I crowdsourced. I, I, I asked him, so what's the best thing about learning? What, what is an engaging uh, activity for, for, for you? And he, he gave this example, and which, which was great, because I was there and I saw it. Um, it was the lab. <laughs> The idea of here's a challenge. Let's bring your thank you, Meg. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Hands-on projects. And for some of us, it's easier than, than others. So you might have to get really creative, your own human skill here. Um, in trying to create a lab, you know, give them a problem. That values their uh, creativity, their problem solving. It brings them in as co-investigators on something that's really meaningful. Um, now, it, labifying your classroom. Again, some of us, it's easier than others. Gamifying. Um, if we have time, I can share a, a game that I created to uh, help students understand uh, evolution of mating strategies. Very interesting. Um, creating discussions where again, we value their personal human voice, their experiences, their struggles, um, opportunities for creativity, for application. And you, as the instructor, as the human here, using your humor, using your experiences, uh, being a storyteller. You know, stories are so captivating. So how can you use that to tell the story of whatever you're teaching? and showing your passion. Again, we're here for a reason. We're not in it for the money. It's because we're really jazzed about this stuff, showing that to your students. So I'm giving you this example of a, a problem posing um, assignment in my evolutionary behavior uh, course. It's a psychology course. We're thinking about how our brains, our minds, uh, developed over time. Um, and this is an example of a, a problem posing um, uh, assignment. So challenges with food. What are some challenges that early humans would have had with food? Getting food, finding food that's good to eat. You don't want to eat that, right? Well, that's a problem. I found a peach, but what's going on with that peach? So I want them to think about what are some challenges that we may have encountered with food, food, food uh, acquisition, storage. Uh, maybe we want to heat that meat because it might have been covered in bacteria. Uh, and then thinking about the possible adaptations to deal with this. And then how do you, te how do you uh, test this? Because in evolution or, of psychology, or, we, can't, we can't go back in time. We don't have time machines. Um, so we have to figure out how do we uh, see the remnants of these evolved processes, these ad adaptations in current humans. What would, what would the evidence be that this is an adaptation? And what's the counter argument? So this is the kind of um, problem posing. And in your discipline, there's probably problems that you can pose to the students and see what they come up with. Uh, this is their time to get really creative. Um, and I think about this, you can do this in a, in a group setting. So you have collaboration, that human skill of uh, social learning, about talking to each other, communicating. Uh, again, this co-investigator uh, model, we're in it together. There's a little power sharing too. Uh, you know, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about how much time I spend in my classrooms just having good old fashioned discussions and how that can also be, um, perhaps it's not the most um, 
probably not turning something into a game, but I think can really lead to some extremely important kinds of conversations. And it also builds on skills that many of us, especially if you're not as familiar with using different kinds of technology, this might be something useful to be trying out in your classes. It's just actually talking about, okay, what are the texts that are using different types of technology and how can we dig into them a little bit more just by having really robust discussions. And so I really love teaching this essay, Ghosts by Bahini Vara, uh, where she actually is struggling to come up with a way to discuss this really difficult emotional time in her life, talking about the death of her sister. She's struggling for months and months, and so she ends up using ChatGPT, an earlier version of ChatGPT, um, in order to really start to think more deeply about that story. And it's a really fascinating essay, because what she does is she includes all that metacognitive work. She goes into depth kind of thinking about, okay, here's what I hope to do. Here's what I discovered through this process. Students love this piece because they many of them come into the classroom already with some assumptions about the use of chat GPT and this really I think is an innovative form but then even more interestingly so Vahani Avara um, about a year later she came out with this new piece because many people like myself were using her essay in the classroom many students were saying oh this is a great way to use chat GPT and she's like well wait a minute actually I have a lot of ambivalence about this technology I don't want this to replace the type of work that I do as a creative writer I don't want us to all be having essays where we're using ChatGPT exclusively in order to go further with ideas. Um, and we've had some great discussions in um, several different types of my writing classes, creative writing classes, literature classes, really talking about the implications of these pieces. Um, so I think just reading and engaging texts that consider the challenges that new technologies pose together as a community can be really fruitful. Um, rather than shying away, I think sometimes there's a little bit of fear that, oh, if we if we read an essay using chat GPT, that means that we're saying you have to use this in the classroom. And I really just want to encourage everyone to think about how that doesn't have to be the case. I talk a lot about my ambivalencies with this technology, um, especially when we have people who are, you know, there's lawsuits right now going on about, okay, what's happening with intellectual property. So really important. They're happening in the classroom and outside of the classroom. Um, talk about these things with our students. That's why we're here. Have students reflect on their own experience navigating these issues. And I think it's helpful that human skill of just having folks kind of talk about their experience rather than telling them how they should feel about a particular kind of technology. We do a lot of effective work in my classes, so thinking about your emotional response. And I think that that also helps to cue us into the fact that these are human skills that we're talking about. Um, model examples of how professionals are grappling with these issues. And then I think also sharing our own experiences is always really helpful. It's something that came up in our larger discussion that, you know, that's something that can't be replicated with a YouTube video or with some other type of technology. You have that type of interaction. Building empathy. Very human skill. Uh, in fact, I included this uh, picture, robot therapist. Um, recent article, uh, 2022, um, surveyed people on uh, their feelings about um, AI in a therapy sense. Um, and their number one hesitation was around empathy. You know, is, is the robot going to be able to understand me and have that sense of uh, you know, I, I get your, your experience. I can put myself in that uh, experience, that real deep empathy. So at least from this study, uh, it, it seems like uh, this is a very human skill. So how do we cultivate this in our classrooms? Um, I think it's us starting by seeing our students as more than just the hour and 15 that we get with them. They're, they're humans outside of the classroom. We have to build empathy for what they're going through. Um, that might result in things like uh, flexibility on, on deadlines. You know, I know that it's midterms time and you might not be able to, uh, you know, you might have three papers due that day or hearing them out on what they're struggling with. I do a check-in oftentimes, this is the therapist to me. I do a check-in, how are you all doing? Just to get a sense, to read the room, to get the temperature of the room um, and I think that models empathy building, and I hope it comes back to, to me too when I'm a little frazzled or I have a misspelling on my slides or something. Um, so understanding and doing that perspective taking. I think it also is part of relationship building, what, what Hannah was talking about, that we were maybe missing this with the, the years of the pandemic, that sitting with somebody, building community, and this can be, I know the students don't like group projects. There's ways to do it thoughtfully. Um, 
when I've uh, posed group projects, I have them reflect for a moment on what strengths they bring to the table and then expressing that to the group. Hey, I'm really organized. Uh, I'm good at task management. Uh, I, I'm an introvert and I don't like presenting. Uh, can I do the research? Great. That's one way of sort of building empathy, telling the other members what's going on with you. Um, and, and hopefully they can uh, give that back and give you some grace. Um, so uh, yeah, and, and leveraging those, those strengths uh, as part of the, the team building approach. Because here's the thing, even though they don't like group projects, in the future, in their workplace, they're gonna be working in teams with people that they might not get along with. So building those human skills of collaboration, really important. I always ask students um, how they're doing. And I once had a student come up to me after class and she's like, why do you ask us that every class? Why do you ask how we're doing? And I'm like, cause I care about how you're doing. And she was like, oh. <laughs> Which I thought was really instructive. It was really, and she, she started asking, how are you doing to me too? So it's just getting, getting to know those kinds of skills. Um, human imagination, it shapes our experience and allows us to create new possibilities. This can be done alongside AI while also preserving authentic kinds of human creativity. Um, so I think sometimes we feel like we're a little bit at battle with AI and I'd like for us to think about the ways that this is something we can still be cultivating these skills. Um, so I find that if you're going to be using AI in the classroom, and I, 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 I preface this with I feel ambivalence about always using like AI in the classroom, um, but if you ever ask ChatGPT to generate an image for you, and they had just an article in the New York Times about this, um, the images will become more and more surreal and bizarre as you continue to ask. And I, I had some students last semester um, who actually, they we always generate at the end of the semester, we talk about what we learned all semester, and we also, I asked them to choose an image of, oh, what's an image that really just encapsulates it's how you're feeling. It's the last week of the semester you're preparing for finals. And every year it's, it's hilarious because they always come up with the darkest, most dismal images that you can imagine. They have um, students who are just really suffering through the work that we give them. And this year I had a group of students who said, hey, what if we use ChatGPT? And I thought, hey, that's kind of, a, that's a creative use of this. And so it was so fascinating because they actually, they plugged in, oh, you know, students, you know, devastated by the amount of work they have to do. They got an image and they're like, no, no, it needs to be more devastated, needs more books, needs to be more, more crying, more. And so they included these images and we kind of talked about together as a class. And what I liked about this, this came kind of organically after we had spent the semester talking about it, is I think it shows how um, rather than just like leaving them to their own devices, we can really model ways that these are tools rather than something that you just rely on. This seemed like active work. Obviously, if I was teaching a graphic design course, this might not be a good thing to do, right? We want them to be in that class. I would imagine that we might want them to generate their own images. But for the purposes of this particular assignment, I thought it was a really useful way to really get at that effective sense of how are we feeling at this point in the semester. So I find this sort of three-pronged kind of um, technique towards using AI in the classroom. You want it to be collaborative. Every time we've used technology in the classroom, I want my students to collaborate when thinking about it. Okay, so this group actually used ChatGPT together um, and they were able to then talk about, okay, what words do we want to use to generate these more and more interesting, strange images? Um, you want to also have time for them to reflect on the experience using sort of metacognitive skills. And then you want to have time to talk about as a class community, okay, what did we just do with this technology? What are some of the pros? What are some of the cons? And taking it back to like discussions that we had for my class about the movie Her, okay, are we doing what happened in Her in terms of Theodore Twombly with like outsourcing love letters and the risk of falling in love with ROS? Or are we doing this in the service of greater critical thinking, greater creativity, more humanity? And so I think that really centering these conversations, it doesn't have to be every class, but this is, this is the world in which we're living in today. And I think it's really helpful to be guiding our students through it. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to point out is incorporating many models. I mentioned this earlier, the students today often, one of those headwinds are, they really wanna know, okay, what do you want me to do so I can get the grade that I want and get out of this class? Um, we really wanna to show, okay, there might be more than one way to think about this. And so having, um, I find that resisting giving them any models whatsoever just might make them a little frustrated, but really showing them, okay, there's, there's multiple ways, different perspectives, I think helps to give them a next step while also embracing that sense of, hey, we want you to be taking risks. Um, making it personal. 
Uh, this is this another uh, finding the the humanity in our students uh, is making the content personal. And I I have the Chipotle model. I think about <laughs> Chipotlefying my courses, uh, making it personal. You go in, everyone gets a scoop of rice, everyone gets the beans, and if you want guacamole, you can get guacamole. You want extra cheese? We'll give you extra cheese. Uh, so I think that's really important because then you really get to uh, leverage their interest. Humans are naturally curious. How do we make sure that we're giving them something that feeds that curiosity? Um, so uh, I give them choice. Um, in uh, my human sexual behavior course, I had 19 different topic reflections. They only needed to complete three of them. And they were interesting and provocative. Uh, things like uh, children with gender dysphoria, uh, teens in porn. I had a topic on dick pics and sexting. Uh, and there were scholarly articles and there were popular things. Oh yes, that was, that was a popular one. Um, <laughs> Podcasts, all sorts of things where they can really dig in and make it their own. You know, I gave them the, the rice and beans and they took it from there and added and really learned what they really wanted to learn. And I think that this is more meaningful. It's, uh, I'm already interested in this. Let me learn more about this. Um, and I hope it sparks passion. Um, it also <laughs> allows me to help value their personal experiences um, that I hope would enhance learning. Um, another uh, uh, assignment I had, a, a term assignment, long-term uh, long assignment, uh, was a personal voice project, which you can't chat GPT, um, because it honed in on an identifiable group where they had to interview somebody, or if it was their own identity, uh, reflect on their own experiences. And when I say identifiable group, it was maybe uh, people who are asexual, people in long distance relationships, folks who were trying to conceive, um, uh, trans individuals. So find an identifiable group, uh, learn about them, again, through interviews, reflections, reading memoirs, uh, looking at documentaries, find, and, and this is empathy building. So try to understand their perspective. Uh, I gave them the assignment of creating an empathy map, really understanding the perspective of those individuals, you know, for, for the empathy piece, but also the personal piece. And then I had them uh, create questions, empirical, testable questions, and then go to the literature. Find out what researchers have already learned about this group. And then the next step is taking action. This, I, I hope, and I, I felt like it was pretty meaningful, um, would create that sense of, uh, I'm doing something that matters. I'm a change maker now. I'm taking what I have learned about this group, what their struggles are, and I'm trying to address, by creating some project, those struggles. So I had a, a, a great, uh, lots, lots of great examples. Uh, this is one student who um, had some friends who uh, were non-monogamy, ethical non-monogamous uh, relationships, and she really wanted to learn about it and notice that there's a lot of stigma uh, against folks in uh, open relationships, poly relationships. And she uh, reached out to uh, a research group uh, who, who looks at this, looks at uh, media presentations of folks in uh, non-monogamous relationships, uh, and they assess, you know, here's this Netflix series, and there's uh, open relationship folk, poly folks in there, and, um, you know, had a rubric to kind of identify as this stigmatizing or not stigmatizing. Um, and they asked her, she said, I want to contribute. And they asked her, could you, uh, you know, write a, an op-ed or write a, um, a blog post uh, about your your studies, what you're learning, and she did. It was so cool. Uh, I had a, another student who uh, was uh, learning about people with vaginismus. It's a, a pain disorder, and through her uh, investigation and the, the research, she found that a lot of med students aren't uh, getting a lot of uh, information about this disorder, and so she uh, kind of started, I, I want to find somebody who's... Um, uh, you know, teaching in a med school, and I want to give them information. Good thing my, my sister-in-law uh, is a professor at a med school, and so I connected the two of them, and the student provided uh, her with a lot of uh, information um, to give to the med students about this disorder to kind of help, the take action piece. 
Uh, I had a student who uh, identifies as Arab American and was concerned about the attitudes uh, that she was hearing about uh, from other people that are perpetuated uh, by porn uh, about uh, Arab American women. Um, she did a really interesting deep dive into the history of this, the impact of Arab American based porn, um, and created this mini documentary that just blew my mind, uh, so thoughtful and definitely a passion project. Uh, she wanted to make a difference. All my students wanted to make a difference. And I think by this personal project and choice, uh, they were able to really um, find something that would make a difference. Oh, oh this is my focus. Um, Lastly, we wanted to think about take-home messages. Uh, again, valuing the, the humanity in our students, that it's not just about here's the content, here's the exam, do that. That I hope, um, and I have been flattered by my students, that they, they talk about my courses with their roommates, their friends, their family. I mean, again, think about the topics that I discussed. Um, that there are take-home messages. I, I often go, all right, this is news you can use. You know, doing online dating, news you can use. Let me tell you about the research. Uh, kind of, again, leveraging their curiosity, leveraging their, their, their personal. Um, and this, you know, we, we think about what we can offer them. I, I hope that they remember what they're learning. And if we think about the news you can use, the sort of take home message, the application of this, I think we can really create some great, great assignments around that. And just thinking about the skill of transfer, so thinking about, you know, how does the work that we're doing in this particular class connect to other types of classes that you're going to be taking? You know, in this, in my writing classes, we might be working on a very particular type of assignment, asking a particular question. How can that apply? And we'll just have conversations about this directly. How does this apply to other things that you're doing? I love hearing about what my students are doing in other classes. I find it really fascinating, um, especially, I know, for writing classes. Um, just Five minutes, five minutes to go. Um, so I've sometimes worked with business students that it's been very fascinating to see, okay, what are you writing about in a business class? Because that's something that, you know, I tend to take a more humanities approach to how I'm teaching writing, but I'm really curious to hear how my students are thinking. And so I think that considering that to be collaborative can be really helpful too. I want to make sure we get to everything for our last few slides. Um, yeah. So we'll just shift ahead a little bit to thinking a little bit about classroom culture. Do you wanna? And, and so this is where I, I think broadly about teaching, about active versus passive learning. Active learning are those uh, labifying, gamifying, you know, giving them a problem, let's struggle with it together, as opposed to here's the knowledge, memorize this knowledge, that very passive learning that happens. Um, value not just what is learned, but how they're learning, how they're answering the, the, the question, the doing of whatever your, your discipline is. Um, and creating more personal and meaningful assignments like the ones that we've provided uh, as examples to, to really make this worthwhile. Again, if we're in an existential crisis with higher ed right now and, and AI and what we can offer, the value of education, we've got to make it worthwhile to the, the students. Yeah. So we thought we'd just give some examples about creating a classroom that values what it means to be human. Um, and one thing that I think is really important that our students really are hungry for right now um, is incorporating self-care as a kind of academic practice rather than this separate kind of thing. Our students need to learn that like there's going to be a normal sort of flow to the semester and there might be times that are going to be more stressful and times where there's more time to just kind of reflect on things a little bit. That every class is going to have its own kind of tempo and so I I like to actually do check-ins like Erica does and kind of say, okay, what can we do to make sure that students are taking care of themselves, their physical bodies, their emotional selves, um, so they can actually then be better students in the class. But these things are connected, they're not separate. Um, embracing time to think through ideas. Um, we're all under this crunch of efficiency right now that we have to be doing 10 million different things at the same time. I always joke and just ask students, okay, how many have more than 10 tabs open in your laptop as we speak? Everybody does, us included, right? That's just kind of part of the world that we live in. Um, and so allowing students to really slow down a little bit is so important. Um, considering how our emotional experience are shaping our, our intellectual growth, 
And then supporting students in cultivating this type of growth mindset. I always tell my students it gets messy before it gets organized. This is absolutely true for a writing project, and I think it's true for a lot of the other work that we're doing in the classroom too. And so encouraging them to see this is not an error. This is actually just part of the process, which I think connects to the, the next slide. Um, encouraging our students to make mistakes, which I think can be hard um, with a lot of our students and maybe ourselves too can be perfectionist. How can we cultivate a classroom where we're actually valuing what comes from making errors, um, including building block steps with assignments so students get the chance to practice returning in a final version. In my classes, we often have an entire semester devoted to a research paper that we break up into smaller chunks. So it feels a little bit less overwhelming. They can learn those research and writing skills. And so they get the sense that, oh, yeah, halfway through the semester, the paper's not going to be as strong as when at the very end when I'm turning in that final version. Um, compliment students when they take a risk, even if they miss the mark. This is great in class discussion. It's also great if a student turns in an assignment that doesn't have a perfect score on it, um, encouraging them. I mean, I think that I, I often get this feedback from students that just having comments consistently that are saying, I'm appreciating the work that you're doing. What a human skill. What a human value. Um, include examples from professionals in your discipline who needed to shift gears at some point. Writers love doing this, especially writers who have been extremely successful. At that point, it's easy to go back and say, oh, yeah, I made a lot of errors that kind of led up to this point, or there were things that were challenging. And I think focusing on readings that do this will help our students to understand that it's a natural part of the process. And finally, discussing your own experience making mistakes. What it's been like for you in academia, what it's been like for you as you've been pursuing a particular project, what are some things that have come up? And I think this mistake, making mistakes or encouraging mistakes, is related to, Alison, what you were talking about with the authenticity. Their authentic voice, your authentic feedback, that's the place for growth. And we can't do that if, if we're not making mistakes. So we're just going to end on, yeah. on, on this quote that we came up with. <laughs> we have the power to guide our students to consider their relationship to new technologies with greater nuance and to recognize the importance of their human skills. This is what we're hoping to do in our classrooms. And we are hoping that you can do that as well. We're a team effort here. Um, I think we have like zero minutes to answer questions, but we'll stick around um, and be at the reception. If you have any questions or thoughts about this, love to get, extend this. Thank you so, so much for-, for Thank you so much for coming. Now we need the margarita. <laughs> Which is there anything interesting at the reception? No margaritas. It's just a oh. darn. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs>